Brother Tinobu arrived the country yesterday, the president-elect, and a lot of uh, visitation, which some of these uh, uh, close allies have said, uh, one of the reasons why he needed to leave the country to go and get some rest. Well, um, today we've, we've been receiving uh, leaders of the party, members of the National Assembly, and ahead of the inauguration uh, of uh, the new administration, some senior members of the APC are uh, assuring Nigerians that the incoming administration will not fail to deliver on its manifesto of renewed hope. Senator Banabas Gemade was one of those who spoke to China's television. And of course, those you can see are on your screen. Uh, Senator Pam Bamdele, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and Bajabia Mela, Senator Goswe Akpabio, one of those who are eyeing the presiding officer's uh, position. And of course, Senator Baraji Bring from Kano State. Uh, let me allow you to listen to uh, as, uh, the... Uh, one of the leaders of the party, Barabas Gemade, and what he feels about the issue of zoning in the APC, and of course, uh, Senator Tanku Al Makura, the former governor of Nasara State. Take a listen to both of them. This fourth republic has come with a new dimension, and everybody expects that there should be zoning whenever government is about to be formed. And I believe that uh, the uh, both assemblymen and senators in this country know that there will be some form of uh, zoning so that they can have a spread of all the principal positions um, in that sector of government. So I believe uh, it's something that ought to be done and it will be done. This is not a matter that is an open door kind of issue. You always have to put a lot of things into consideration. So it's not something you can just stand and say, this is the way it's going to be. I believe that when it finally uh, comes out, it will be acceptable to Nigerians. That's the most important thing. Inclusiveness is all we are looking for. Uh, we have to comply by the uh, spirit of the Constitution. Uh, a situation where everybody will have a sense of belonging and self-determination. Uh, it's very, very necessary that if we have to have a stable government, uh, government uh, a very peaceful separation of powers, we also have to consider what the Constitution says about giving everybody a sense of belonging. Well. You heard uh, Senator Tanko Amakura and uh, Barnabas Gemade there talking about inclusiveness. How the uh, Tinubu will have to meander some of the landmines that are always setting themselves ahead of the National Assembly inauguration and the politics of the National, especially that of the leadership of the National Assembly. One of those who are uh, uh, who is looking for um, the office of uh, the Senate President, Goswe Akpabio, also spoke with China's television. Take a listen. The issue of Senate Presidency is a function of the Senators, and particularly all the Senators elect, including those who are returning, and they are all my colleagues. I've had the privilege of serving the Senate before as a minority leader, and so any Senator should be ready if his colleagues so wish to avail himself to be used as a Senate president. So the chances for somebody like me will be very high because of the fact that my colleagues already know my track record. Yeah, Gazwe Akpabio, uh, Senator elect from Akwa uh, Bumstead, member of the APC. But it's been a beehive of activities, uh, the, those stalwarts uh, of the APC have thrown the residents of the president elect, we might be seeing those kind of visitation in the coming days. It's just uh, less than 40 days before Bola Tinobu and Kashim Shatima will be inaugurated as president and vice president of Nigeria. Let's get a sense of what this means for the APC, for Nigeria, and uh, in, in fact, uh, all of those tendencies have been thrown up in those scenarios. I have joining me uh, an APC lawmaker. Senator Ibrahim Olori Egbe, a member of the APC from Korase. Thank you so much indeed for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. I mean, interestingly, today is World Malaria Day, and you are the, uh, the Senate Chair on Health. Um, if you see what is happening in Angola, for example, 
uh, one would think that the situation and perhaps what is being done here is not enough in Nigeria in terms of vaccination and fighting and dealing with the scourge of malaria. What more can we do to really uh, deal a decisive blow or make sure that malaria is not uh, a factor that disturbing the health of an average Nigerian? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, we still need to do more, but if we go by the uh, what I call the slogan for this year's World Malaria Day, which is time to drive malaria to zero, invest, innovate, and Im implement. The first action point, investment, is what we need to do more in Nigeria. Uh, currently, the resources that are allocated to malaria directly are mostly from either donor or uh, what we call, uh, what we get from loans. Because majorly, most of the strategies that have been implemented have been done through those investments. Of course, we have huge indirect investment that goes to address malaria. Because when you talk about malaria, it's a major public health issue in Nigeria. 60% of outpatient attendance in Nigeria is because of malaria, both at the primary, even at our tertiary hospital. As such, the salaries that we pay to staff, the investments we put to put all those infrastructure together are geared towards malaria. So, but we are talking of direct investment. So, one of the things that we need to do more is to improve and increase direct investment. Now, the innovation part of it, you mentioned the issue of uh, vaccines. Nigeria is yet to start or commence an issue of vaccines. The first vaccines that was approved by WHO, the RTSS, Nigeria has placed another of one million doses. That's very small because one million doses will treat to 50,000 children only because there are four doses per child. The vaccine is given at five, six, seven months, and one year of age. So, but there is uh, light, I mean, at the end of the tunnel. The R21, which is a new vaccine, which recently, about two weeks ago or so, NAVDAC has approved it uh, for use in the country, will be a game changer because Nigeria will be participating in the fourth stage of the trial of that vaccine. The first vaccines, Nigeria was in part of the country where the trial was conducted, but because of the WHO approval, we can use it. But the production of that first one is very minimal worldwide. So the production line is very minimal. That's why it's only one million. For our population, that's very, very small because the total population in Nigeria is 200 million. If you look at the percentage of under one, one million, 250,000 doses is just 200. But with R21, we are likely, we are going to get more innovation. Now, the third aspect of the malaria, I mean, the, this year, this is about implementation. I think we, we Nigeria is, trying, is doing more. And if you look at it, I mean, so far, if you look at WHO report, we are not regressing. We are progressing as far as concurrent malaria is concerned. The last report indicated that we have less number of deaths compared to what we used to have before. And we have less prevalence. It may be small, it's about 22%. But in, if you look at WHO report, the total number of cases that were averted and total number of deaths averted is quite significant. So we are making that progress. And then with the coming in of the new multilateral uh, credit that we have from World Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, and the uh, African Development Bank, about $364 million, which was approved by the National Assembly uh, last year, which the implementation has started now, that will enable the various strategies to be expanded from 24 states to all the 36 states of the country. With that, I think in the nearest future, by 2025, when the current strategy we, which we have will expire, we'll be able to have moved on and move well. So the thing that will be critical is for us to invest more, is for us to take the innovation in terms of the new vaccines, because we are yet to start it, and then to implement those strategies intensively across the country. I mean, malaria might sound very, because uh, average, everybody in Nigeria suffers from malaria, and uh, I mean, it, it sounds so common and commonplace. But if you look at the estimation, malaria is seen as the biggest killer of in Nigeria, with about 10 million cases and a, an average of 200,000 deaths yearly. That More than 10 million cases. It's about 51 million cases per annum. Per annum. But of course, about 173 million of the population are exposed to exposed malaria. Exposed to malaria. So which means it's almost, I mean, about 200 something million. So and he million. says about 200,000 people are being about killed. About 207,000, what was, was the estimated death in 2022. Two. So it's quite, it's a big, it's so a big if, problem. If and most of those 207,000 are, are, are children 
and pregnant women. Under five children and pregnant women are mostly affected. So, so what we wonder, I mean, what kind of government will not wake up when that huge number of people are being killed by a disease that is commonplace? And I'm wondering the number of uh, money that you said is being plowed in dealing with malaria, it's not so much. We're getting one million doses of the vaccine. Isn't this the kind of situation that a government that is serious about fixing or, I mean, that cares about the health of its people to, I mean, we should be getting 10 million doses, uh, vaccine doses, as, uh, as even I not said, for Nigeria? Is, there, there are two issues. There is the issue of availability. The production. It's just like when the COVID-19 vaccine But do we started. even have, uh, have we even no, no. subscribed to it? Do no, we have when budget we for subscribe, it? we only allocated one million. That's why I said the R21 will be a game, a game changer because the country, the manufacturer of that R21 are trying to manufacture about 200 million globally. And of course... Is there a plan in the budget for it? No, not in the current 2023 budget. And that's why I said we need to invest more. There's no plan. There's no, in the current 2023 budget, we don't have budget allocation for malaria vaccines. If that, so, those vaccines work, how drastic do you think the deaths that malaria causes will be dropped? No, it will be very, very, very drastic. It will be very drastic. I mean, because with that, it means that there will be 100% pre prevention. But I must say something also. You see, when we talk about investment, uh, even for the vaccine, it's not only to invest to buy the vaccines. There are other indirect investments that is required to deliver the vaccines, which will be total increased investment in health. Just like when I appear in your last program, we were talking about the health worker issue and so on. Mm -hmm. I said we need to invest more in health. Our current budget allocation to health is less than 5%. And we are committed in 20, 2001 in Abuja to 15%. And I said a new government coming in must at least start from 10% from 2024 budget. If you allocate such to health, it means we have more resources that will go to systems that will deliver whether it's the vaccines, whether it's any other intervention. Right. I can agree with you that, you see, maybe because of the commonality of malaria. It makes people, it makes think people But the cost is very huge. You yeah. know, the cost of treatment, not only cost of death, even for those that survive, mm -hmm. if you look at estimates, the total cost that malaria costs about 122 billion, 132 billion naira to treat malaria annually. Uh, because, but it's, most of this comes about two, two Over two trillion. About two trillion was estimated is, is, yes. based on projection of if that is if everybody have complicated malaria, mm -hmm. which is estimated between twenty to sixty thousand, an average of about thirty thousand, and they multiply that by fifty one million. Ma, ma, I do know that, but ma, I think senator, the, my, the my conservative point, my, ones my, that my we point, need to invest more. Yeah, my, my point here is, Senator, if there is something that kills people more than any other thing in Nigeria. I think we should pay more attention. We to are it. paying that. We, 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 the government is is paying attention to various strategy, but I still they need to do more. I should do, do more. agree with you. All right. But not only federal government. I think it's government at all levels, because to treat malaria is something that should be done at basic primary health care level. Local government level. That's, no, that's why I said basic yeah. primary health care, which Absolutely. is a local government yeah. level, state responsibility. responsibilities. But the but we, you, you and I know what, what happens to local government funding. But that is what that's where we have to. If those government, state governors and the guys as local and government. the governors are not aligned them to really utilize their funds. That's where we have to go. Let me take you to other area. Well, I mean, people should know malaria is the biggest killer in Nigeria, and attention must be paid to it. I agree with you. That is that needs to be emphasized, and so that everyone who is around and need to know in government that they need to pay more attention to that. Thank you so much, Chair Senator. Let's go into the politics of the National Assembly. <laughs> Do you see this being more dramatic than ever? Well, it looks like that, but I think the party which I belong to, APC, should be able to handle the situation. Uh, everybody, just like many people that are interviewed there, any elected senator can aspire to be a leader in the Senate because it's forced among equal. Except for the new timers. Oh, except for the new timer. Thank you. Yeah, except because the rules... Any ranking senator, yeah. I want, I let, me, let me be right, because the rules, our current rule, the 2022 uh, uh, rules amended, 2015 was the one we came in with, we have amended it. Even 2015 and 2022, ranking is very critical and important. And uh, I learned, I mean, I heard from people saying there will be a member, no, no. It is, ranking is an international universal accepted. And it can so, only be from the majority party. Uh, well, that is not in the rule. In your Senate rule? And the well, is it in the House of Reps rule? I don't know you about don't... that. I, I've not gone through the House rule, I must admit. But Senate rule, what it says is that it's about ranking, 
and it's about you being nominated. It means you cannot be nominated if you are not ranked. So a ranking is number of times in Senate, not even, you are, the ranking is classified into uh, two. First is number of I mean, times you have been in the Senate, then the House of Rep membership comes in later. Or House of Assembly. The House of Assembly is already in our rule. <laughs> it's only considered so a convention. But those who feel very bad because they, there are some of those who have been speakers in the in the houses of assembly and now probably in the house of reps or senate they seem to be seen as lawmakers you know they are seen but like uh, when i got to the senate also i had uh, assembly ranking i did raise this one i was told that well this is what is in the rule but I, it was considered in two things for me it was considered in terms of my being given a chairman of the, the kinds of committee that i had and it was even considered in terms of the allocation of office, where my office now stays, because allocation of everything... What about your seat? No, oh, well, the seat was based on alphabetical order of okay. all the first-time senators. So my seat was in... The ranking was used for the initial first, second, third, three, to all the other senators. Once you are first-timer, alphabet is used to be able to put uh, the seat. So seniority matters? Oh, of course. It, it's a very important thing in the National Assembly. So, you, I mean, uh, today I was reading where someone like Femi Fanika there was making reference to uh, the pairing of uh, Oju Zokalu and uh, uh, Senator Sani Musa. Uh, there are all those now who are also pairing because we are Pabio and uh, uh, Senator uh, Jibring uh, from Kano State. Deputy. I mean, they, they as Senate, uh, Deputy Senate President, all of this pairing, it does look like the party is also fragmented. There are those interests. And you can see, uh, Gosu Akwabio and Senator uh, Jibring uh, are well, well with Bola Tinobu. Uh, <laughs> in this whole handling, because this is also first and foremost, the prerogative of the APC. APC stepped in in 2015. But well, you know what happened with your friend, uh, Senator Bukala Saraki, and uh, what happened again in 2019, the party doesn't look like it learned from what happened in 2015. But what do you think is the best way to handle this? I, I think the party learned less in 2019. I was part of the 2019 process, and we had the meetings of the party. And you can see that it went in the direction of where the party wanted it to go in 2019. So the 2015 was a lesson learned by the party. I know, you know, the party came in very, very late, and that was why what happened happened. In 2019, the party came in early. And the party caucus met, and the party, even not only for the Senate president, for the deputy Senate president, I was aware of what went in the party, where the party had to ask some ranking senator to say, okay, please can you step down, allow this to go like this because of the zone in the party. So my, uh, as a member of the party and a critical member for that matter, I think the party will step in and come into the situation to come up with a proposal. And as you can see, many people that are speaking, everybody is waiting for that. So, but of course, you have to first of all show your aspiration. And uh, outside the Senate President, the Senate President, there are other positions also, which will come into consideration based on your aspirations and the uh, other interests that will be given. I mean, that will be considered. But, I mean, there are those who say baggages on one hand for some of those who are uh, aspiring, uh, those who say, okay, the, the politics is not favorable. But, for, I mean, so. You look at zoning on one hand. You look at uh, those who gave the party, because there are those who are in your party who are saying, look, first and foremost, put aside zoning. Let's look at those who gave the party votes into this election, and you analyze it. APC won in 12 states. Out of those 12 states, you won only in one state of the Northeast, two in the North Central, four in, uh, in the, I mean, Two in the north, uh, northwest, four in north central, four in southwest. This is how your party won in 2023 election. Would you say, consider first those who gave us votes other than zoning? Uh, well, you heard what Senator Almakura said. I think the election, yes, is over. We need to consider that. But now we have a country to also consider. The, lead, the leadership of the, the governance. It's about it's, there should be inclusiveness. I think the interview you showed earlier shows what Senator Almakura said. I think the party will look at the party that wants to govern the country, Nigeria. And uh, part of what the Constitution, under Section 14.4, try to do is to be able to see that we stabilize this country called Nigeria through various means, including the fact that there must be federal character in everything that we do. So, and I think this will come in into play in terms of the thinking of the party. So, the essence of zoning 
is to be able to address that spirit of the constitution in terms of inclusiveness, in terms of carrying everybody along. So all will come into consideration. Two, there are very various ways through which the party will be able to, if I want to say, reward uh, the various uh, segments or sectors that have brought in votes. Because without the vote, you can't be talking about all this we are talking about. So it's not only the National Assembly leadership. There are other ways through which that can be handled. So a lot of people think that there are a lot of experience uh, in and around Bola Tinobu. There is a firm by Yabia Mela. A lot of people think, oh, that, that may be the chief of staff to the president. And uh, he's a speaker. He's one of the most experienced lawmaker in Nigeria today. Uh, you look at even Bola Tinobu himself was formerly uh, oh. a senator. His wife, uh, Senator Lura Mitunobu, is a sitting uh, senator. senator. So, and you have a lot of people who are very close to Bola. I mean, this is the time that a lot of people believe that the handling of the National Assembly politics should be better than ever before. Do you think so? Yeah, I think so. And I believe that is what will happen. Because the president himself is very experienced. He was a former uh, legislator. He has been a governor in the state where he has handled, and in the state where, which is quite cosmopolitan and complex, and has handled twice and leadership issues at that level. Not only that, mentioning all those that you mentioned, and beyond that, other, other, other um, capacities available within the party will be able to come in. And as you mentioned, one of the things, again, is the lessons are always learned in life. 2015 was a lesson learned by the party, and I'm sure I would say by the country generally, that will also come in to make the party to come in in a very good way to see that there's peace, and that we have leadership that's accepted by all. And that we're able to get the National Assembly that will work together with the executive to deliver for Nigerians. Well, Nigerians are very, very now critical about the activities of government, especially National Assembly members. And Tinobu will have a lot of pressure on his shoulder because a lot of Nigerians will now look at him critically with, with, with fine lens on how he does things and how he goes about things. And I'm not sure there is so much of patience. And now your party will be under pressure, isn't it? And what kind of National Assembly do you think will satisfy the interests of Nigerians? Uh, I, I think it's a National Assembly that is, uh, one, uh, ready and willing to be able to analyze policy issues and come up with uh, objective suggestions to the executive. And, but two, in doing that, it's not to be antagonistic, but to be uh, cooperative and complementing. Because that's what will happen now. If you look, let me say even the current National Assembly, with all sense of uh, responsibility, people look at it. There were key legislative proposals that passed through, which before ITATO had not been able to go through. The Petroleum uh, Industry Bill, which is now the Industry Act, was for, the part, for many governments that we've had before now. It didn't pass through. But it took this National Assembly to pass it. The electoral act that everybody's talking about, in the last uh, eight years, it didn't pass through. But you can see that we are able to do that. The offshore, onshore. So several of that, that even from my committee, we, we have a game changer in the health sector, the National Health Insurance Authority Act, where we've made the health insurance mandatory. That law started in 2007. I was, I was in civil society team then, where we have been pushing for that, for the amendment to the 2000 to 1999 National insurance. But it's this National Assembly that was able to achieve that. So there were several things that we have done. But it's because there are, we have to look at what is happening currently. This is the global issues, the issue of COVID, the economic meltdown that happened globally, and then the issue of security in the Sahel that is coming here. So the government, yes, will be, Nigerians are expecting, so I mean, things to happen. All of, everybody's aware, both the people that are elected into the electoral position and people elected into the National Assembly. So it's a National Assembly that is how we become aware of the needs and expectations of Nigeria and working with the executive to be able to hit the ground running. And I can tell you from yeah. behind the scene that the, the elected leadership, president and vice president, are already working on that. They are already having policies, discussions, and policy... Uh, how, how, how volatile president. do you think things could be? 70% of uh, the senators elect are new members. Same mm. thing in the, in the national... Uh, uh, they are, they are not 70% that are new. There are some who... 70% are not are members new. of the current Ninth Assembly. But there that's what some, I'm saying. They are new members. Okay, but they are, not, they are not necessarily new. For example, if you say Senator Pabio, 
It's new to the 10th assembly, but it's not new in the national assembly. They're not assembly. returning. I so see what ahead, you mean. Ahead, yeah. You get my point. We yeah. have several, I mean, like uh, uh, the senator from Bauchi, Abdul Ningi, yeah. is returning he's from returning, back. Yes. So we have several members of House of Reps who have now but, moved But the case the is different in the House of Reps. You yeah, have... We have newbies. The newbies. Yeah, newbies. There are a lot of, uh, the Senate, a lot of them. In the who Senate, are if you add those ones that are either members of House of Rep or those who are former members, it will reduce from. And that you have more, more numbers oh, of minority political parties. There are going to be eight political parties making up the National Assembly. Do you see a volatility? No, I don't see that. Politicking. I don't see that. And I'll tell you why. I say, current member of the current National Assembly. You know, we started, it's about the same thing. APC has 60 when we started. And the minority had uh, 49. But of course, it's only PDP and YPP that we had. But when, we, when, we, we, when you get to National Assembly, when you are in the chamber, you are not, there is no issue of party. It's all about the country. When you are a committee, it's not about, oh, I'm from this. We, we are not operating a parliamentary system of government, mind you. We are operating a presidential system. And in the parliamentary system, where there's a, 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 a key party, 12 party positions, in the presidential system, because the president is an executive this thing, when the proposal comes, you look at it objectively. Either you are majority, you are minority, you make your opinion. And this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is the members of the ruling party that make critical points. Or what I mean by critical is that to be able to criticize policies. But at the end of the day, you agree. Whatever is agreed to is what is part of the executive. So I want to tell you that I'm not worried about the multiplicity of parties. And because opinions. Uh, the, and op opinions. The, the opinions will not, at the end of the day, the opinions will be opinions of representative of Nigerians, All right. for betterment of Nigerians. Senator Ibrahim Oluri Egbe, uh, Senator of the APC from Kwarase, thank you so much indeed for sharing your experience and uh, your thoughts about some of these issues with us tonight. Thank you so much. Indeed. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I appreciate it. <laughs>